thank you for joining us for Washoe County Library Systems Art Town Mondays with the Nevada Historical Society. Today's topic is gambling. It's older than you think. Our presenter is going to be Mark Ullum, and our host from the Nevada Historical Society is going to be Linda Burke. My name is Aurora Partridge. I work at the Spanish Springs branch. Um, please join us for our other upcoming Art Town Mondays as well. It happens every Monday in July. And each day will feature a different speaker and topic. There's one in the mornings at 10.30 and one at 1 p.m. So please join us for those. You can register for the future Art Town Mondays on our website, events.washoecountylibrary.us. This event is going to be live and viewed via Zoom and also our Facebook page. Um, if you want to learn more about Nevada history, please check out the online Nevada encyclopedia. You can access that from the Washoe County Library website, washoecountylibrary.us, and then navigating to the resources link. Again, welcome, and thank you so much for coming here today for this talk, and thank you to the Nevada Historical Society for transitioning this to a digital event on the fly. We appreciate that, and we love working with you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Linda Burke from the Nevada Historical Society and our speaker today, Mark Ola. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to the Nevada Historical Society's History Series this summer. We're so grateful to the Washoe County Library System and to you, Aurora and John, working behind the scenes today to present our series. I'm a docent, a volunteer at the Nevada Historical Society where I've led school tours for many years. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the Historical Society before we get started today. The Nevada Historical Society is the oldest um, cultural institution in, founded in Nevada in 1904 by history professor Jeannie Weir. You can see her picture there. And she doesn't look like it very much, but she um, was very worried about the rapidly disappearing past of Nevada due to our boom and bust cycle of Nevada's economics. And she set about personally collecting everything she could. She would go out on horseback, on, in, by wagon and cart and later train to collect and preserve the materials across the, the countryside. She also wrote letters to old timers to get them to reminisce about their times on the Comstock and other mining towns. She begged company um, executives to send their materials. That's why we have the, the uh, 20 mule team model um, in our museum today currently. The Nevada Historical Society is located on the University of Nevada campus and consists of a museum of Nevada history and a wonderful research library filled with thousands of photographs, including the oldest known photograph of taken in Nevada in Virginia City on July 4th in the early 1860s. Our, due to the pandemic um, virus, we are currently not open, but will be open hopefully July 15th. And I suggest that you look up our website and I'll put that up later shortly. Um, it will be open to the public on Wednesdays. Um, admission is $5 and free to children under 17. The uh, opening hours are 10 to four and our research library will be open from 12, 12 to four, sorry, um, on Thursdays and Fridays. And admissions will be by um, reservation. And of course, there'll be protocols due to the corona pandemic um, masks and social distancing will be uh, mandatory. Also, currently, our director has, has asked you all, just like Jeannie Weir in her day when she was collecting reminiscences, we want to collect uh, COVID-19 stories and, ex and uh, experiences. So if you would like to share some of your experiences during this time, you could submit them by our website and we, I have it up there now, or email them or snail mail them to our director, Catherine McGee, McGee to the address or the website there. So now I'd like to introduce our, my fellow docent, Mark Ullum. Mark is a retired industrial engineer with BF Goodrich, who has also practiced law for 40 years in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. He has served nonprofit organizations, including his church, but currently he is our treasurer on the docent council at the Nevada Historical Society and works on, on the American gaming archives. So that makes him particularly um, uh, relevant to his discussion today, his talk, which leads us into the topic gambling. Gambling and it's older than you think. So ladies and gentlemen, Mark Allen. <laughs> 
There we go. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be with everybody this afternoon, uh, at least virtually, if not in person. Uh, hopefully in the, uh, the very near future, we'll have an opportunity to see things open up and get together in person so that we can have some walks through the museum and through the archives to show you some of the, uh, the artifacts and the history that's be behind what we're going to be talking about today. The uh, presentations that I'm going to have throughout Art Town are two. This one focuses on the history of gambling and gaming. And yes, it is older than you think. The uh, uh, artifacts that have uh, been found and the uh, drawings and the records that have been found go back much further than uh, most people would realize. This session then will be talking about history and next week, same time, same station, come on back. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the artifacts that we have and how much more those artifacts tell us about our American history. So stay tuned for next week, but in the meantime, let's get started today. The screen that you see here first entitled Gambling, It's Older Than You Think, is actually a screenshot from our computer system uh, at the Historical Society. This is where we get started recording and tracking and analyzing artifacts, uh, documents, and other information that uh, uh, has been gathered over the decades that the Historical Society has been in service. So uh, if I were sitting at my computer, I'd be clicking on that objects tab up there in the upper left corner, and I'd be going in looking for items that I need to study and get additional information from. Uh, or I would be entering new objects, and we have a very substantial uh, uh, inventory of objects that are still being recorded. Uh, gifts that we have received from people who found things around the house or had things come down to them from the family and uh, asked themselves, what can I do with this? I don't have any place in the house. Well, let us know. It's amazing what history there is to be found among those auto objects that are found not only out there in the dirt where ar archaeologists often look, but in the attics, in the basement, in the closet. Things that have come down from the family that tell us so much about our future. So, question one. Anybody remember Cas Casablanca? Ask yourself that. Captain Louis Renault, the prefect of police and old buddy of, uh, of our friend, uh, says, I'm shocked. I'm shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. Just as uh, the croupier there in the casino walks by and hands him his winnings from the last roulette spin. He says, oh, thank you very much, and he walks on. Well, for longer than we know, that has been going on. We have had gambling and gaming of all different kinds over the centuries and, in fact, over the millennia. And that's what this is all about. Let's first draw the distinction between the two. The difference between gambling and gaming. Gambling, we know, requires three things. Consideration, money, objects, a risk, a chance, which requires randomization of the results. We'll talk about that in a minute. And a prize to be won in the gambling process. But that has expanded much further than that over the years, over the centuries. It also includes gaming. Whether or not there's a prize other than the satisfaction of having won the game. They have existed side by side over the years, over the centuries. But there is that distinction. Oh, gaming, by the way, has also been used to uh, get past the law on the subject of uh, gambling. Where gambling has become illegal, we can just play the game as long as we don't have something at, at stake. And a good resource, you see the, the link down there in the slide on the right, is Wiki, Wikipedia. Have fun going to Wikipedia sometimes to so just click on gambling and read through some of that and see where that tricking takes you. We're going to start in the era BC. That's before cards. You see some dice there. Singular, it's a die. In that picture, you see four dice. 
the old French de and the Latin datum, which you see refers to something given or played, small throwable objects with multiple resting positions. That's what dice are. And they're used with tabletop games, of course. There you see four traditional six-sided dice, but there are many sides to our dice. We'll find out a little bit more about that in the very near future. So does this just go back to the old French or to the Latin? No, BC goes much further back than that. Try the Chinese. There you see a set of six six-sided Chinese dice used for various games. The rules for those games, some of those rules escape us, but we do have the dice, so we know those games existed. Go earlier. Try the Egyptians. Yes, there were Egyptian dice as well, all different sizes. In this case, they were all six-sided dice. Now, we know about these in this case because we've found some in tombs, but in other cases, we find hieroglyphics and other writings that depict what was going on in the Egyptian era. Now, for this time period, we're going back, oh, roughly... 3,000 years BC. That's before the Common Era, not just before cards, but before the Common Era, where hieroglyphics showed Senate boards. Yeah, the first link that we had with dice was to table games, board games, as a randomizer to pick a number and use it to progress in your game. The oldest confirmed dice in a dig was in Turkey. Uh, along with some uh, other game pieces, and that was dated as near 3000 BC, maybe a little bit less. Holes were found punched in clay floors in the Mexican uh, in a Mexican site, similar to modern dice game scoreboards. And in 2600 BC, we found the oldest confirmed dice, a pyramid type dice, found in the uh, in a board game, and that's a four sided dice. Kind of an interesting game. Then cubicle dice. Then you may have heard about knuckle bones, animal bones, knuckles used uh, as randomizers. Well, yeah, that's a, a thousand or 1500 years BC. All of that before any of the time period that we knew, that we knew in our own uh, research. Then of course there were the Romans. I think what we're looking at here is a Roman crap game. Basically a Roman crap game. And as you can see, it's recorded on a wall. There they are. I can't exactly see what the device is that's on the table there, but we see the hands uplifted as if they're getting ready to, for, to throw the dice. And keep rolling forward to like 300 B.C., that's where you're going to find the oldest 20-sided dice. Don't know if you've ever seen those. Or 150 BC, Egyptian 12-sided dice. And over the time period, you come into the 1900s, and what do we find? Dungeons and Dragons. And all the variations that go along with those games. The latest advancement in dice technology, by the way, you might find interesting was in 1985 where the first zocahedron dice that is a 100 sided dice was invented don't know if we'll ever get any further than that it looks almost like a perfect ball but it's out there gambling then from the records and the documents that we found goes all the way back before those time periods that i just mentioned to the paleolithic period before written history, running all the way up through Pai Gao and games in China in the 10th century. It's also in the cards. When we think of gambling, as often as not, we think about playing cards. So let's talk a little bit about playing cards.
Playing cards appeared in the ninth century in China, they say. Records trace gambling uh, through Japan, at least as far as the 14th century. And then there's a game we know as poker, but we also know that there are so many variations of the game. The most popular US card game, deriving, according to this research, from a Persian game known as Asnas, going back to the 17th century. But notice the comment down there. I've seen some other sources that suggest uh, that Persian game may not be the origin of the card games as we know it. So there's some debate on that. And I think that's kind of the fun of research, finding different sources. Uh, I was uh, taught as a lawyer over my years of practice, never to take one authority as the sole authority for whatever happens. Always look for two or more, see where you can find agreement and then try to branch out from there. Maybe that has something to do with uh, uh, human relations too. We want to get along with folks. Maybe what we need to find is our common ground first. Deal with the differences later, but find the common ground and see what the opportunities uh, uh, may be to proceed from there. The origin of poker. Let's talk about that a little bit. The first casino? Okay, well, maybe not. We've all seen the gambling dogs. There are many versions, by the way, of, uh, uh, of this painting. And that one, likewise, is in the public domain and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Several flavors of it. But if you wanna get closer to the truth, try this one. The ridotto, which means in Italian, a private room. A private room here was in the back of a theater uh, in Venice. And actually there were several ridotti with the I on the end as the plural. The 20 or so ridotti that existed in, uh, uh, in Venice were always places to go behind the theater, out of the public eye, where you could socialize in a very friendly fashion. That did include gambling. And oh, by the way, if you look closer at the picture, there is a link to the current day. Masks. We got masks. <laughs> kind of interesting. But why do they have masks? Well, truth has it that what went on back in the Ridotti, back in that private room in the back, wasn't always for public knowledge. Uh, it, although these were mostly people of uh, uh, substantial station in life, shall we say, uh, what went on back in the, in the Ridotto is uh, not necessarily what they wanted broadcast to the public. So there they are. Masquerading back in the Ridotto was popular. What you see here, by the way, in this painting, is the Ridotto San Moise, San Moise. Um, but there were many others. This, by the way, was in the late 18th century. So we're talking the 1700s here, before uh, things came out of, uh, uh, out of the back room. As a matter of fact, in the 18th century, the Doge, that's the governor, the mayor, or whatever you want to call him from, from Dennis, from Venice, and I do say him because they, unfortunately, they didn't have lady doges in those days. Um, he shut down those ridotti for suspicion of conspiracy. And it was some time before they could be reopened as state-run casinos. So yeah, they had a gambling board. They had a gaming board. Sound familiar? For all us Nevada folks, sure enough. Card games. Here's a challenge for you. This is the oldest known deck of cards that we have covered. Uh, cards go back further than the deck you see here, but I don't think there are any other survivors older than this. Uh, and as you can see, those are not paper or card stock. They are more in the nature of two-sided chips. Uh, I have no idea how they shuffled them. 
I really wonder about that. But if we study those a little bit, we can find some interesting common ground. Recognize these guys? There's the king, there's the queen, and there's the jack. That's not a joker, that's a jack. That's one suit. Notice the characteristics that identify that suit. Compare it to these. This is another suit in the same deck. Don't know what the backs of those cards look like. But the artwork that went into them was pretty remarkable. Those were all hand-painted items. Individually hand-painted cards. And then, of course, pips or spots on the dice. There are some interesting pictures. This is the start of the spots that we know now. The interesting, interesting design on these comes mostly from hunting, by the way. You'll find, for example, in this set, these are hound tethers. Used to link your hounds together in the hunt. Now these uh, were confirmed by uh, an institute in Amsterdam that uh, dated the paints and the product to the early 15th century. So we're talking about the early 1400s. This deck of cards, by the way, this whole deck of cards, there it is, sold in 1983 for about $143,000. So if you happen to find any uh, old decks in hand, you might do a little research and find out if there's some value there. So those are hound tethers. Now let's take a look at these. This is another hunting inspired suit in the same deck. Now accepted that this is the oldest known full deck of cards in the world, these cards had categories based on hunting gear like the hound tethers that you saw, horns, dog collars, and game nooses. Here's the collars. There's the horn. Interesting, interesting suits. And if you study them a little bit, you might see some re resemblance to the clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades closer to the decks that we are accustomed to seeing now. These, by the way, may be European in origin, but you'll find uh, similar records of gaming cards going to China, coming from China, and in India, as well as, as Europe. Indian playing cards have several common features with the early European cards, the cups, swords, and rings that were shown in their uh, various decks are sometimes even the closer precursors to the clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades that we see here. They're not sure where these playing cards uh, were first introduced in Europe, Evidence suggests that they perhaps had already been in England because you see the classic symbols of the English hunt in these kinds of cards. See how they have uh, evolved further? There's the diamond sets, but now look at the arrow here pointing to the back of the cards. 
we're now accustomed to seeing very fancy backs on all of our decks of playing cards. Some of them are wildlife themed. Some are geometric designs like these. And next week we'll talk a little bit about the meaning of the backs of those cards and what they have to do with the progress of the game. There's quite a story to be told uh, about those. Notice somebody else who shows up in the deck. Here he is, the Joker. There's the king, the queen, the jack, and now you see the Joker. There's an entire story behind the Joker. Where did the Joker come from? The Joker, the extra card that we now see in decks, doesn't even show up until probably the 1860s for the most part. They believe it was invented by American players who wanted to introduce a trump card while changing the rules of the game. A trump card or otherwise a wild card. And as we know, there are a lot of poker games that have wild cards involved. Most of the games I play, we take out the joker and we don't deal with them and we we all take the cards in their in their natural set, but but they do vary. The origin of the name is kind of interesting. The Joker might have started with the game of Euchre. We'll talk about that a little bit. There's another back of a card. The uniquely copyrighted parts of card, card decks that you see now include these face cards, the ace, and especially the back of the deck. And did you ever know, did you ever realize the playing cards actually fought a war? No, they, they didn't just play in the war to keep the soldiers happy, there were decks of playing cards that actually fought in this war. Take a look on the inside of that card. I read about some of this uh, in some histories from World War II, for example, and what the troops carried with them, and sometimes what the troops uh, received in their Red Cross boxes and stuff, if they happen to be caught serving as prisoners of war, uh, they were allowed to receive packages in some of the camps where they were held as prisoners of war. And when those packages came in, some of those packages were very, very special. If, for example, you got a, uh, a package that had a Monopoly game in it, there would be certain officers under highly classified regulations that would recognize these special packages. They all look normal, except for the one that might have a special dot on the back of the Monopoly board somewhere or on the pack of cards. And that little black dot or little red dot would tell an officer who had training that that particular gaming or gambling device, whether it's a pack of cards, a Monopoly game, or any of several other things, actually was a key to your safety and to your escape. In this case, what you're seeing here is a replica because you can't find the real card anymore. But what they did was to split that card in half. When they made that card, they actually put maps on the insides of those cards. If you knew where to look, you could find that map, you could open up those cards, and if you were able to escape, you could take those cards and use them to show your way out of camp to safety. The same thing was true, by the way, on Monopoly games. If you had a special Monopoly board and somebody who knew how to read it, they would know how to peel the top off of the top layer off the Monopoly game, it would be perhaps a little bit thicker than most game boards. 
And inside that game board, you would find silk maps that you could unfold to the size of the Monopoly board, for that matter. Those silk, silk maps would be silent, easily concealed, readily portable. So yes, gambling and playing cards, gaming of all different kinds, actually played a part in fighting the war. If you were able to get out of camp, or if you were out in the sticks somewhere doing your job as a soldier, you had resources like this available to you. If you were securely trained and authorized as an officer to understand where to find that information and where to pull it out. Now, food for thought. Julius Weintraub tells us here, the guy who invented poker was bright, but the guy who invented the chip was an absolute genius. Some truth to that. The first chips might have been pebbles. The second chips might have been any other object that we wouldn't even recognize today. So we don't have any of those to really recognize or to use with our games. But we do know they started in clay. And here you see some old clay chips that look ordinary enough. But that's only the beginning. The library of available chips, amateur and professional, is very substantial these days. From the clay chip that you just saw there, we move on to the plastic chip, like the red one over here on the left, that they value at maybe a penny a chip, or more sophisticated designs, like the Super Diamond. And look at the six cents a chip. Those have card or card uh, images, like from a deck of cards. And then we to go to some with denominations on them. Some of them with inserts. Look at the copper or metallic insert inside that. They get more and more sophisticated until you get into the highly professional casinos. And one of the things we're gonna be talking about next week when we get into gaming artifacts and we have thousands and thousands of chips on style on, on store for uh, all different kinds of uh, gaming activities, we're gonna explore the way these chips were developed why they were developed, and what we can learn from the manufacturer, the design, the manufacturer, and the use of these chips to keep score. Because after all, gambling is only a part of it. Gaming is only part of it. Keeping score is the object of gambling. More examples of evolution. Notice these little Notches in the sides of different kinds. These notches may suggest layers in the chip. No longer a solidly molded chip, but it may be layered information. In this case, you see also denominations on paper uh, or vinyl uh, inserts that identify not only the amount, but they also identify perhaps the manufacturer, in this case, Yang Ming. Or the house, in this case for slot machines. And pay attention to these little inserts because these inserts, we find out next week are much more than just metal inserts. And of course, you can always roll your own. If you go online looking for uh, all kinds of uh, gaming chips, you find all those places, all those places where you can put your own claim to those chips. You can make them as fancy or as simple as you like. Why would you do that? Well, maybe that's for your own establishment if not for your own house. So where does poker come from? 
Some will say it's the German Pochspiel or the French Poke. The word suggests a bluff, which is at the heart of all gaming, isn't it? Of all gambling in, in poker. It's the classic gambling bluff. So when you started gambling, that's the first thing you learned to do. Let's talk about some of the most popular games of the day. Euchre. I came to know Euchre uh, growing up uh, as a kid. In our family, it was a popular regional game uh, in uh, Northern Ohio. And that's where we learned that the boss in the deck is the jack of your trunk. And the number two card in the whole deck becomes the second jack, the other jack of the same color. So in this case, if you're playing spades, that is the perfect hand. There is no other card in the deck that can beat this combination of cards. It's a trick playing game. It's like bridge, but a whole lot shorter and a whole lot quicker and a lot of fun. Like I say, I, I learned that it was a regional game. I've learned since then, but it wasn't just regional. It became popular all the way across the country and especially popular uh, from World War II up to the present time. Then there's Pinochle. That combination of cards, well, that too is the boss of the game in Pinochle. That's a single Pinochle. That's worth a lot of points in your hand. But the double one, because there's two of every card, like the Jack of Diamonds and two queens of spades in every deck. Now, these are all played with conventional 52 card decks. In this case, you take uh, the top cards in the deck from 10 up. Here, you take uh, the top cards in the deck and you have a deck of 48 since you're doing two of each. 24 cards doubled. 48. Then, of course, blackjack or 21. There we go. I didn't learn much blackjack as a youngster. And the odds vary from one casino to the next. And then a case, then, of course, there's today, not only today, but tomorrow. We find the World Series of Poker online. You can find it broadcast on television. You can find it on your, uh, on your laptop. And that perhaps is the future of gambling and, and gaming as, as many people know it. And that, that's going to raise a whole lot of new issues about how people socialize and how people recreate without ever having a card or a deck uh, or a chip in hand. In all of this, there is one thing that we've learned. The safest way to double your money is to fold it over once and put it in your pocket. Ken Hubbard might be right, but I got to say it's not nearly as fun. It's been a long road. Now, maybe you recognize some of these dice because you got a sneak look at some of them early, and you saw some of these old clay-type chips. And next week, if you join us, you'll learn a whole lot more about how those are made and how they have evolved over the years and, in fact, centuries. Join us next week, then, for the facts that we are finding in American artifacts. The screen print that you see here is what happens when you look up a record for one of our artifacts up in the Nevada Historical Society. A gaming chip, a single gaming chip, or a die, 
meaning one out of a set of dice, has its own record here. The record that you see here has to do with the manufacture of chips and dice. That's what we're going to be exploring next week. It's amazing how much you're going to find just from studying those artifacts, where they came from, a clue to where we are going, I believe. So, as our forebears have been asking for millennia, do you feel lucky? That's my question to you. Thanks for joining us. Any questions? Back to you, Linda. All right, Mark. Um, from Lorraine, are the prices listed on the screenshot the manufacture price per chip or present value of that check for collectors? Uh, what you see there is most likely the price of the chip if you ordered through that vendor. Some chips are very, very cheap to make. We see them in the stores all the time. They're just simple plastic stampings. There's nothing unique about them. And you might produce those for a penny or two a piece. Uh, and uh, uh, you can probably buy them for all about the same. But if you get into these more sophisticated chips, the technology that we'll be talking about uh, next week We'll explore that. And some of those chips are downright expensive. And that's for security purposes in the casinos. We'll talk a little bit about how the casinos uh, customize those to, to make your gambling experience a safe one. Had you listened to the History of English podcasts on the history of the playing cards? Uh, no, I haven't caught that podcast. I would welcome a site would love to go through it. Yeah, and someone recommends you read episode, you watch episode, episode 135. <laughs> okay. Right, from, from um, the Washer County Library, were the chips always used in Nevada gaming to stand in for cash? Yeah, I'm, I'm leery of using always uh, as, a, as an assignment. I mean, a lot of times, even at home for that matter, when we use chips at home, we may not be playing for cash, we're just using the chips as a, as a scorekeeping device. When you start using them as a stand-in for cash, that raises some real security issues that we'll be uh, exploring. There is always such a thing as counterfeiting chips, for example. Even the formulas for making clay chips, uh, some of those formulas for uh, uh, the chips that are simply stamped are secure. They're locked up in a safe. I've never seen those myself because I don't need to have access to them. So yes, there are security issues even in the simplest of clay chips. Um, Lorraine also wants to know which museum has the oval cards in their collection? Uh, oh, the, the chip that we're finding here are the, uh, the cards that you saw there, the, the uh, oval ones. Um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art bought that 50 far, 52 card deck from uh, uh, of South and Nederlandish playing cards. Those dated from the 15th century uh, in a an Amsterdam antiques dealer was sold the pack back in the 70s for about $2,800. Said to be a unique pack of uh, tarot cards, but the dealer bought the deck and was, skept was skeptical, did some research uh, and came to an article in 1983 they suggested they might be uh, might be older. So we don't know exactly how old, but it traces we know at least as far as the history of that particular deck is concerned back to 1983. I don't know where the where the uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum received those in 1983. Okay. And uh, do we have many old decks of cards and and die in our museum? We have thousands of uh, die, uh, sometimes individual die, some kind, sometimes sets of die, similar to what you saw in these slides, like these from all over the place. Uh, we have uh, decks of cards. As a matter of fact, uh, overflow decks of cards, we sometimes have available for sale in the museum. If you'd like to 
take a sealed pack of, of classic cards home. We sometimes have those for sale. Uh, in other cases, we have open packs that have actually been used uh, in casinos uh, uh, across the state. And yes, we have hundreds, thousands of those as well. It's a pretty deep collection. And as a matter of fact, our gaming artifacts collection is, to the best of our knowledge, the uh, largest uh, known in the country, if not the world. Good. Thank you, Mark. Um, Joseph says, very nice. Thank you. And um, Lorraine says, thank you. Wonderful pictures. And she wants to know the name of the Italian gambling parlor, the Rodotto, I suppose. The name of what? Of the gambling parlor that you had pictured. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure whether she means the Ridotto or the other one. Oh, the Ridotto. Yeah. Yeah, that was a painting. The Ridotto was a painting. And there are several versions of that uh, painting that are out there that, I, that I've come across. And uh, next week, we're going to talk about some of the parlors that nobody knew existed and how we found them. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you again. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you for the Washoe County for uh, allowing us to have our, our history talks. And uh, we hope to all see you again next week. And don't forget to check out the website and send in your COVID stories. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you, so, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mark, for that informative presentation. Um, and remember to sign up for the Art Town Talks that are continuing on Mondays through July. Um, the sign up link for those is events.washoecountylibrary.us. And thank you so much, Mark and Linda Burke, for putting this program on today. It was great. My pleasure.